Good evening and welcome to the York Consortium for Conservation and Craftsmanship and to the second in our series of Second Tuesday Talks this autumn. My name is Susie Clark and I'm a member of the Consortium Committee and I'm a photographic conservator and consultant. We've been running these Second Tuesday Talks since the summer of 2020 and are pleased to have a wide audience from across the UK and indeed the world. We're delighted to welcome many members again tonight. And so I hope that our regular participants will forgive me for saying a few words about the consortium by way of introduction. The consortium was established 20 years ago in recognition of York's central role as a hub for conservation and craft skills within the heritage sector. And we've built upon this to emphasize a close integration between conservators and craftspeople and to provide a point of focus for both practitioners and those interested in supporting our heritage. The Foundation's annual bursary scheme has also flourished and we've provided over 250 bursaries to support the development of craft and conservation skills. So I'm very pleased to welcome our speaker this evening, Jack Lowe. Jack has had a love for photography since childhood and prior to this project worked as a photographer's assistant in London during the late 90s and as a digital retoucher and printmaker for other photographers and artists for some 12 years prior to getting back in touch with his analogue roots through the Lifeboat Station project. And it's great to have you with us Jack, this evening. So before we hear Jack's speak there are a few housekeeping matters. Uh, we're not anticipating any issues but if we do encounter any technical issues please do bear with us. You're welcome to submit questions during the presentation if you could put those in the questions and answers box rather than the chat box that would be great. Um, we also anticipate a finish time of around eight o'clock but if there are a few outstanding questions we may go on for a few more minutes and you're welcome to join us. So now for Jack's talk, the Lifeboat Station project by Jack Lowe. Jack's eight year mission to photograph 238 RNLI lifeboat stations using a 19th century process on glass. Okay, over to you, Jack, if you'd like to share your screen. Thank you very much, Susie. And good evening, everybody. I will just pop in to share my screen. Right then, the Lifeboat Station project, as, uh, as Susie just said there. Um, thank you once again for joining us this evening, for joining me this evening to come and hear about this. I want to say right from the outset um, with the Lifeboat Station project that there's no plan B. I've been doing this full time now for, for some seven years or so. And um, each of the dots that you see in that graphic there represent a lifeboat station on my journey. So as Susie mentioned, I'm um, traveling to all 238 um, RNLI lifeboat stations in the UK and Ireland um, over a period of what was initially meant to be three to five years. Um, but that seems quite laughable now um, because here we are seven years later. And if things will go smoothly from this point, I still have another three years left. So I never would have thought <laughs> in, in, ever that it might have taken me the best part of a decade to complete um but let's not even uh rest on our laurels there either so look from the outset because I've, as i said I've, I've committed everything to this and there is no plan b i've had to have the attitude of sir william hillary these motivational words that he told his lifeboat volunteers back in 1824 when he founded the National Institution for the Preservation of Life from Shipwreck. Um, and when the RNLI called me down after I proposed the project for a second time, um, you know, it was initially, I, I initially came up with the idea in 20, 2012, and then it was rejected at first. Um, and when I went away to lick my wounds for a couple of years and make it better, I reproposed it when I knew it was better. Um, and uh, they said you better come down for a meeting and these words were right there in the atrium at the headquarters to the RNLI um, in pool with courage nothing is impossible and as I sat there in that atrium waiting um, to be collected for my meeting I thought this is exactly what I'm going to need right now these words these 
these words from the founder, Sir William Hillary. And to cut a long story short, uh, I had that meeting and received the blessing of the RNLI and drove some 350 miles back to Newcastle upon Tyne, where, where I'm based, um, and was just gradually digesting that news and how my life might change from that moment onwards. And I was, it was a weekend and I was watching a film um, and I heard these words, do or do not, there is no try. And I thought, yes, between with courage, nothing is impossible and do or do not, there is no try. Those are exactly the sentiments I'm going to need from this moment forward. And who said those words? Some of you may know this. It was Yoda in Star Wars. But why the R and I? Why photography? Why any of it? Well, I grew up on a boat. Um, this is the boat that I grew up on for the first few years of my life. And um, she, here she is in, in Ramsgate Harbour. And if you look closely, you can probably see my pram on the pontoon there. Um, this is in 1976. Um, she's a lovely old vessel, as you can see, 1885, originally built as a steam yacht. Um, and that period, 1885, 1886, and the, early, and the mid 1800s seems to keep cropping up in my life. So it might explain quite a bit as to as to why I'm working with wet collodion today. And from an early age, I got into photography as a classic scenario of my grandmother giving me my first camera, a Kodak Instamatic, which you can see here around my neck. Um, and I know you'll just have to trust me with this, but that badge um, on my jacket there, that's a Stormforce badge. Um, and Stormforce was the junior membership program for the RNLI. So from that, early age of eight when I got into photography and then nine ten-ish when I got into lifeboats they've been childhood passions for me so the lifeboat station project is really um, a unification of those childhood passions and here's my first photograph of a lifeboat in 1985 this is uh, in Brighton Marina shot on my Kodak Instamatic I was really proud of this this is um, an Atlantic 21 lifeboat for all the aficionados who might be among us. Um, and this is me now. Well, not now, this is me in 2017 um, with my camera over my shoulder um, and a huge seven class lifeboat um, behind me as well. And these seven class lifeboats are the largest type of lifeboats that the RNLI build. They're such impressive pieces of kit, 42 tons, three and a half thousand horsepower, top speed of around 28 knots. Um, and these kind of vessels are called all weather lifeboats. And that's because they will go into all weathers to save anybody at sea. Um, and it's quite something to you know, see and hear one of these things fire up and head out through the harbour wall into, a, into a, a tumultuous sea to rescue somebody it really is a, um, an impressive sight. And this is a kind of typical scene that you might see um, when I'm working on the coast with the lifeboat volunteers. And remember, remember they are all volunteers. Um, you know, even after nearly 200 years, the organization is still funded entirely by voluntary contributions. Um, so these are the people who volunteer at Fishguard Lifeboat Station, and you can see them lined up there with the, with the Trent class lifeboat behind. Um, and as it happens, just to, just to the right there in the bottom right hand corner is Pete, who was making um, a film about the project at the time which you can now see uh, on the website um, under the films section. It's a lovely five minute documentary that still really sums up the project nicely. And when I'm working on the road, it's hard not to make comparisons with this chap. Um, this is Marcus Sparling, who is the assistant to Roger Fenton, um, uh, who famously photographed the Crimean War in the, in the 1800s. Uh, using the same process that I'm using, wet collodion. And one of the things about wet collodion is that you have to have mobile darkroom facilities to hand because once you've started the process, you have to complete it within about a 10 to 15 minute window. Um, so this was Roger Fenton's converted wine merchant's van, um, which as you can see on the side there says photographic van. Um, and really the only difference in the way that we work is that I have my own mobile darkroom of course but it isn't a horse-drawn cart or horse-drawn van it's a decommissioned NHS ambulance and here she is in her full glory 
Um, and if you look closely on the door there, you might be able to see that she's called Nina. Um, bear in mind, she's decommissioned an NHS ambulance. Um, so I, rather than tell you why she's called Nina, I might just leave you to ponder that one unless you've worked it out right away. But as you can see, the red lights are on there, the safe lights are on in there, ready to make, um, ready to make glass plates. Um, this is on the coast at Warmer back in 2018 um, on the Kent coast on a lovely balmy September evening. Now, the logistics when working with wet collodion um, are quite considerable. We've already seen that I have to have a mobile darkroom um, with me. I can't load up slides and then shoot them and then take them back to Newcastle and process them at a later date. I have to do it all there and then. So that means that I also have to think about how much, um, how many materials I'm going to carry with me because I can't carry memory cards that will give me thousands and thousands of images. I have to think about the, the amount of plates I might shoot and how many chemicals it would take to create those glass plates and then develop and fix them and wash them. Um, so I've yet to get it wrong. Um, sometimes I'm having to call up my friend Mark who makes them for me um, to say, oh, I need some more collodion. <laughs> um, you know, if I think I'm running a little bit low towards the end of a four or five week mission, as I call them. Um, but this is what my collodion and developer looks like just before about to pack it away, um, ready, to, ready to hit the road. And of course, I need to carry all my glass with me. I need to anticipate how much glass I might need to carry. So I carry uh, these special boxes that, uh, again, this my friend Mark, Mark Vos, has made for me. We've settled upon this design over the years. Um, I have about... I think about 16 to 20 of these boxes now um, of varying desi designs and varying sizes to carry my glass plates. And I've got one here uh, with me, um, which we can look at in the Q&A if you'd like to at the end. Um, so this is a way that I safely carry my glass. And this is Nina when she's all packed up um, with all the things that I need. This was actually quite a short mission. This was only about... Like, I think it was about eight lifeboat stations, something like that, eight or nine lifeboat stations. So she's not as full as she might be. Um, and I remember having to be really concerted here with how I was packing her because I actually made this photograph um, at Kirkwall, which is um, on Orkney. And you catch the ferry to Shetland from Kirkwall. And that's an overnight ferry journey of some eight hours through the North Atlantic. So I was really nervous because I'd already been to about three or four lifeboat stations. Um, and the further you travel, the more precious the cargo gets because the plain glass becomes the one-off light sculptures, if you like, you know, these one-off uh, photographs that are all stored within these boxes. So I had these thoughts of going into the rough North Atlantic and praying that everything would stay safe and the glass would stay safe as we crashed on the through the waves on the ferry um, but thankfully everything was all right but this is what she looks like anyway and um, when, when we're ready to go and the logistics never end you know I always have to be thinking about every single step um, what, and often have to be three or four steps ahead and I've learned over the years that I can't just turn up and start making glass plates and look like a some kind of mad fool running around in an apron um, with, without anybody knowing what I'm doing. So I take the time and trouble to gather them all together and brief them as to what will, exactly will be happening so that everybody knows what to expect um, and how the time is going to pan out. Um, so this is in Bucky on the northeast coast of Scotland um, and I had a wonderful set of photographs made by um, uh, a PA um, journalist uh, Jason Hedges who made this nice series of photographs here that really showed the, the process quite well but you know when I'm briefing people I, I can end up in all sorts of amazing locations and here's another one in Dungeness again on the Kent coast um, with a Shannon class lifeboat on her mobile slipway and there are the crew they placed her perfectly to the meter for me it's exactly where I want her and as you can see I'm standing there shouting up to them telling, telling them what's about to happen so once I've composed the photograph um, through the back of the camera and, and got my composition sorted and, and know what photograph I'll be making, I need to dash back to Nina, my mobile darkroom, and start to make a glass plate. 
and that involves pouring salted collodion onto a piece of highly polished glass. You know, I've always uh, taken care to polish the glass the night before. I do it as closely as I can to the actual actual shoot day um, to make sure that the glass is as clean as humanly possible um, so that when I'm shooting the next day, I can just pull it out of the box and pour the collodion straight onto it. Um, and you can see there that I'm pouring this, um, pouring it very carefully. Uh, and I would, would be about to stop pouring at this moment so that I have this pool of collodion on the glass. And then I'll rock the glass just gently from corner to corner to corner. And then I'll drain the excess back into a bottle um, so that I end up with this lovely clean film on the glass, uh, which I can then place into my silver tank. Um, which is a tank that's full of silver nitrate solution. Um, I have my silver tank here as well, if you'd like to see that afterwards when I finished, uh, when I finished speaking. Um, and it goes into the silver tank for three minutes. And then once it's sensitized, once the chemical reactions happen between the silver nitrate and the, and the salts in the collodion, um, I then need to close the door of Nina and put on the safe lights because the glass at that moment has a light sensitive photographic film on it, you know, a handmade photographic film on it. And this is the kind of scene that I really like to see, um, a lovely opal finish on the glass, you know, that reactions happen just as I'd like it to. And I've got this lovely even coating on, um, of light sensitive film on the glass. So there you can see I've just loaded it into the plate holder and I'm rubbing away the excess silver nitrate. Um, then I can put the light tight lid on it and hurry back to the camera. Well, I say hurry, <laughs> I don't want to, you know, um, less was it less uh, less haste more speed that kind of scenario um and so here you can see i'm just checking my focus again before making the final photograph and i'll have the plate the wet plate with me there um just by my feet um ready to put on the back of the camera when i finish checking the focus um and once the exposure has been made um i then have to go back to nina again um, to process the plate straight away. And I take some lifeboat crew with me and the lifeboat crew, you know, eight or nine of them cram into the back of Nina and they watch what's going on. And so this is the moment when I've just poured fixer over the finished plate and they're just seeing the image appear. Um, and I'm starting to look a bit more relaxed in my face after what's usually quite a tense few minutes of high concentration to make it all happen very smoothly. And this is one of the things that we get with wet collodion that maybe we don't have with other processes. This wonderful engagement, you know, they're all absolutely fascinated by what's been going on and they can see the finished glass plate moments after um, I've exposed it and then processed it. And I love this about it. You know, the people feel like they're involved in the process. They feel like they're involved in something historic that's being made right in front of them. And that's true. That's exactly what's happening. And there I am with a very relaxed face, holding the finished glass plate, um, having just, um, you know, exposed that plate to, I don't know, about 10 minutes earlier, perhaps. So there's, there's a lot that's happened between um, the, that focus check uh, and loading the wet plate onto the back of the camera, exposing the plate, and then dashing back to Nina, processing it to this moment here, where I can just hold it in a much calmer manner. And there you go, there it is the right way round. It was, it was laterally inverted before because that's physics, but this is um, the beauty of shooting on glass. You can turn the piece of glass the right way round and see the image um, correctly, uh, vertically and laterally. And this is a good moment to perhaps tell you or remind you if you didn't know, or sorry, remind you if you did know or tell you if you didn't know that this is still after 170 years, the highest resolution photographic process ever invented. And there you are, there's a, a little segment of that glass plate. And just as a reminder of how small an area that is of the plate, I'll zoom back out again, and you can see the see the faces there that we've just been looking at. Remember this plate is 12 by 10 inches. Um, um, so they're quite a, a decent size. So the area we were looking at there was really small. And I mentioned earlier on that when people are looking on and they can see the image appear before their eyes, this is the magical moment really when I've developed the plate, um, I've stopped it with a couple of litres of water um, and the plate then is no longer light sensitive. So I can open the door of Nina, let the daylight in and there's this 
magical moment where the plate appears to be negative, but when I pour fixer over it, it appears to switch to positive before your eyes. So that's what they were looking at. Although I know this is a different plate, but that's what they were looking at um, before. This is the Kirkwall Mechanic Dupree Strut back in 2016. A really beautiful moment. I love, you know, it's something that never grows old, even now having made so many glass plates. Um, when it works as well as that, it's a thrill every time. So you've seen the logistics, you know, you've seen a, a very, very fast oversight, really, as to what's involved. Um, and so perhaps you can understand that it's completely beneficial to be as close as possible to the lifeboat station with my mobile darkroom. And people have often seen this picture in the past and said, oh, well, isn't that brilliant? You're right beside the lifeboat station there, Jack. How excellent is that? No, it's not always, things aren't always what they seem, you know. This is not the lifeboat station. This is the winch house that controls the funicular lift that takes you 140 feet down the cliff face to the lifeboat station. Look at this. That's the lifeboat station down there. And then I have scenarios like this, of course, where I may be as parked as close as I can, but I have to walk 250 meters down a pier, even just to set the camera up and look through the back of it, and then to walk back to make the glass plate and to walk back again to load it on to expose it and then walk back again <laughs> to process the plate to get the idea. And what happens if there's one lifeboat station um, on the Isles of Scilly that I need to get my mobile darkroom to? Well, of course, she has to be craned onto the deck of a freighter and because uh, I need to take my darkroom with me. Now I've had scenarios where people have said, Jack, why didn't you just take a, a darkroom tent because it'd be much, much easier. And I just think, well, where's the story in that, you know, when I can do this? I mean, this is quite um, a heart in mouth moment, I must say. But, you know, she was transported over there free of charge because some of the crew on the freighter are lifeboat crews. They had it arranged that she was taken across there. And what a wonderful story. And it's those kind of lengths that I go to, not only with the logistics, but with wet collodion from the outset, that create this kind of engagement. You know, people are able to hold their glass plates moments after they've been made and really see a beautiful object that's been made right in front of them and they've been a part of. You know, it's a true collaboration. You know, I wouldn't be able to make those plates in the way that I can without the people I'm photographing being totally on side. Sorry, just going back there, that was uh, Leafy Dumas. She's the first woman I photographed. Um, that's at West Mersey Lifeboat Station on the Essex coast. And this is uh, Steve Tag Saint. Um, he's the Aldbrook Oxen on the Suffolk coast holding his plate, you know, and who would have thought that that would end up becoming the front cover of the Independent Weekend magazine um, just a few months later uh, in a cover feature on the, the Lifeboat Station project and the RNLI. You know, working in this way gets these people into places that perhaps they wouldn't ordinarily be seen. And I love this um that they called it riders on the storm you can see that maybe just there um in the copy that's on the on the cover there riders on the storm jack close portraits of our like crew men and women and working in this way and making such a beautiful historic project means it gets picked up by various people and preserved in various archives this is uh, where some of the prints are um held in the uh, national library of wales um in aberystwyth and as I was walking along these corridors with the curator of photography, uh, Will Troughton, I saw this corridor and all these boxes. And I said to Will, these are the same boxes that I use for my glass plates, you know, one box per station. And I realized as I counted them up, this is the same size as the lifeboat station project will be when it's finished. And so that was quite a, a daunting thought. And it means that there are some lovely shows every now and then. I mean, the work ha hasn't been uh, shown widely at the moment um because really we're waiting until the end like the you know another three years when the work's all finished but this was a lovely solo show that i had in paul museum um with with the prints around the wall and then some lovely 
um, you can maybe pick out those glass cabinets there um, with some of the um, artifacts from the journey. Um, and one of the cabinets uh, had two of the original glass plates in them. And although there were some 55 prints around the walls, which are obviously beautiful objects in themselves, the crowds around this cabinet sometimes, people just could not pull themselves away when they realised that they were looking at the pieces of glass that were in the back of the camera at those locations, you know. So I've shown you the one on the right, just as I, just after I've made it, you know, that isn't a copy of that glass plate. That is the piece of glass that was in Bucky on the northeast coast of Scotland, now in a gallery in a security cabinet, um, hundreds of miles um, away from that location. But it was the piece of glass that we were all there looking at in Bucky in in Scotland. And you know, even my apron um, becomes a an exhibition exhibit sometimes. Um, you know, again, who'd have thought that my dirty old apron would be hanging as a as a an exhibition piece in a museum? But there you go, beautiful. It looks beautiful like that. And when I've been on the road, it's not over at that stage. You know, um, once I've scanned the plates and made a digital archive of them. I then need to varnish the plates. And then this, this can again be a heart in mouth moment because I've been to all that effort, driven hundreds of miles, spent weeks on the road with all those people that I've met, sometimes hundreds of people just in one four to five week trip. And I can still mess it up with the varnishing, but thankfully it uh, tends to go well. Um, but this is the last stage in the process um, where I need to seal the plates um, and make sure that they're they're good for generations to come. So the original remit of the project when I first started was that I'd go to every online lifeboat station and it started with three photographs at each lifeboat station. You know, it's quite a, all quite a simple idea. I'd photograph the coxswain at the all-weather lifeboat stations. There are two types of stations. You see there are all-weather lifeboat stations with the big boats like you've seen before um, with the orange wheelhouse. But there are also inshore lifeboat stations that uh, tend to use smaller boats, um, rigid inflatables that um, can work in shallower waters and at higher speeds. And the helms, the helmsmen or the helmswomen are the most qualified people at the inshore lifeboat station. And um, so I photograph either the coxswain at all weather lifeboat stations or the helms at inshore lifeboat stations. Um, and here are the helms of Minehead with their fully submersible launch tractor, you know, an incredible piece of machinery in itself, let alone the lifeboat that it launches in, again, in just about any condition. Um, and then, of course, I photograph the crew. Um, how can I not photograph the crew with their boats? And this is at Margate um, on the beach. And I, where possible, if the crew are willing, which they always are, um, they, I, I ask them to place the boat in a way that, you know, we, we sort out the composition and I, if I can include the community and the surroundings um, behind the boat and around the boat, then that's all well and good. So I love this as an example of that. And I love also that you can see the tire tracks of the maneuverings um, in the sand there. And I also photograph the boathouse view. Um, the view from every lifeboat station, so the scene that lifeboat crews are going to when they launch their lifeboat. Uh, and this was the initial idea of the project in 2012, was to do this. Um, and this is the very first boathouse view that I photographed uh, in 2015. Um, and because it's the first boathouse view I photographed, this is the very first plate on the project. And you can see all the disturbances and artifacts there in the glass. You know, they glass plates are brutal sometimes they really have a habit of reflecting your nerves and reflecting your mood um and at the time i was a bit frustrated by all those marks down the right hand side there um which from uh from where i poured the developer over the plate in a slightly jittery way um but now i love those marks because they they tell the story of how i was feeling on day one of the project you know um nearly seven years ago now and the idea with those boathouse views is to show them in geographical order around a gallery space eventually um, so that if they are, are around a huge gallery or a huge room the sensation for the viewer will be that they're looking around the entire coast of the UK and Ireland 
So just to give you an idea what the, of what that might look like, here are four um, lifeboat stations that are quite close to each other. They're not necessarily flank stations, but they give you an idea. Um, they are all on the, on the East Anglian coast, so they give you an idea of um, how that might start to look. And the thing I love about these, or one of the many things I love about these, is that they remind you that no matter how the lifeboat launches, the job that the lifeboat crews are doing is, is the same. They need to drop everything when the emergency pager sounds and launch a lifeboat and go and save somebody who's in trouble at sea. It's as simple as that. And I love that, you know, we see all these mechanisms, but the job is the same. Um, so on the left there, we have Lower Stoft, which is the most easterly point on the network, then Southwold that you've just seen there, which is the first plate that I made, Aldborough, um, just to the right, lots of shingle there, and then the busy port of Felixstowe, and you can see the aft decks there of two seven-class lifeboats um, just to the left of the photograph there. I love that photograph too because of the detail in it. You know, you can see every single wire and and uh, window on the wheelhouses of uh, and the superstructures of the tankers in the distance um, when you look, zoom in on the original glass plate. But when I started with that original initial remit of those three photographs, you know, the, the coxswain or the helms, the crew, the boathouse view, I realised that there were other opportunities too, and I couldn't ignore those. At the time when I started the project, um, the number of uh, female volunteers was about 9%. Um, and I realised I had an opportunity then to champion the fact that women can and do volunteer as lifeboat crew as well, just the same as their male counterparts in a very male-dominated arena. Um, so I started to make photographs of the women as well at the lifeboat stations. And this I love this one because it's Hastings, and it's the first station uh, where more than half of the crew were women. Um, and here they are with the Mersey class lifeboat, um, Sea Link Endeavour, which has now been decommissioned and re replaced with a state of the art Shannon class. But uh, I, I love this, this portrait of, um, of the seven women at Hastings. And how can I resist making a scene like this, you know, recording a scene like this? Um, two coxswains at Wells next to the Sea Lifeboat Station, um, silhouetted in the boathouse. And you can see the Mersey class lifeboat looming over the camera, looming over my shoulder there on the right with these great big chains. But it gives this lovely kind of calm appearance of uh, um, that belies the some of the things that go on once the emergency painter sounds and everyone springs into action to launch the lifeboat. And then, you know, sometimes there are certain people on that I that I come across, like the retired coxswain at Dover, who is after decades is still an intrinsic um, person to the functioning of the lifeboat station and simply has to be photographed as well, you know, because he says so much about the RLI joining the old with the new um, and, uh, and so much of the heritage of the nearly 200 year old inst institution. Sorry, I'm just gonna have a quick sip of water. But, you know, I, I can't, really just call myself a photographer. Um, photography doesn't tell the whole story, you know. It, although I love photography and always have done, I, always I also love making audio recordings. I love using whichever medium is suited to, the, to telling the, a certain story at a certain time. Um, so I make lots of audio recordings too. I interview people and I record the ambient sounds of the sea and the, and the surroundings. Um, and sometimes we just learn so much more when we hear the sounds as well. Um, and I've got a, a little uh, film to show you. It's just under two minutes, but hopefully you'll see what I mean. So this is uh, iPhone footage combined with um, an interview that I'm, you know, a conversation that I had with a coxswain who's above the wheelhouse on this lifeboat. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, mate. thanks for that. I'll take it uh, just when we're 100 metres off or so, Benny. Yeah, I'll be safe. In the old days, the coxswain was almost always at the helm. You know, he might be at the helm 20 hours or. And it was, you know, I've had stories of coxswains being carried out of boats. So you don't really want to have a situation like that in the modern age. You should be a leader, not a commander. 
and everyone on board's a volunteer, so you're leading a group of people, you're not commanding a lot of people. And that role hasn't changed. You know, the person who listens to their conscience is the person that makes the good coxswain. And if somebody says, do you think that's right, you should always question yourself. You know, you have no right to, to be right every time. If somebody says, hey, let, let's just think about that, you go, yeah, I'll think about that. Yeah, it's all yours. I have control. No, obviously. So we're presently heading into Tobermory, where we're going to tie up. It's quite a pleasant afternoon in Tobermory. If you exclude the rain, the cloud, and the wind. Just, just going through Shackle with Stuart. Oh, yeah, it's fine. So as you can see, audio adds to the picture, or as you can hear, audio adds to the picture. Um, and before I speak any further, just to say, ignore the Instagram bit and the Facebook bit at the end there. Um, they are no longer valid, but I'll come to that shortly as well. Um, Twitter is valid, though. So <laughs> remember that one if you'd like to. Um, but as you can see, also, you know, I like to make these into little films that promote the project and get people thinking. Um, but, you know, in that two minute clip, we learned so much that we maybe wouldn't have learned in a photograph. We we learned what it was to be a coxswain years and years ago. Um, and we learned a bit of the of insight into the mindset of a coxswain. You know, you need to be a leader, not a commander. And you've no right to be right every time. You know, these are valuable life lessons. And we learned all that in under two minutes. We also learned what a lifeboat sounds like and what it's like to be on board a lifeboat. We could hear the sounds of it and we could hear the radar rotating above his head. And we also heard the Orcadian accent, you know, the Orcadian dialect. Dialects are softening. And I think it's really important more than ever to be recording dialects. And so to hear such a beautiful dialect as the Orkney accent, the Orcadian accent is a treat as well. And all that comes across in just those two minutes. You know, and it's great to see that other people are really, the pennies dropping with my audio recordings as well, because that audio recording you just heard, that's currently in a cinema film at the moment about the Scottish lifeboat community. It's currently on a tour of 30 uh, Scottish cinemas. And I'm heading up to this one tomorrow on the train from Newcastle going up to Edinburgh to the film house for a live Q&A after, after the screening of the film at, here. But to hear those audio recordings, the one that you just heard there in those kind of scenarios it is, uh, oh, I can't tell you what a treat it is, you know, to see it combined with my photography. Um, it becomes a real, you know, really powerful thing. So where am I now? Well, I've been to 150 lifeboat stations. You know, the last one I photographed was the 15th of March, 2020, um, the day before um, the very first restrictions came in for COVID-19. Um, and so I've made over 600 handmade photographs on glass. They're the finished ones that are on the website. Um, and I've made about 2000 glass plates and um, to finish up with those 600 handmade photographs on glass. So 150 lifeboat stations, which means I've just got 88 stations to go. So as I alluded to at the start of this presentation, if everything goes smoothly from this point, um, I should be finished in just three years time. Um, and on the website, you can see the whole, you know, what's happened in the meantime. This is a video that I made on the day that the project came to an abrupt pause. So that you can see the, um, the URL there for the, uh, for the blog post, so be lifeboatstationproject.com forward slash hold fast. Um, and then various other things that have happened since, um, such as making my work into giant posters in public spaces. That's been a, an extraordinary uh, thing to take on and um, taking that project in a whole other dimension as well. Which brings me on to the project's lifeblood, or as it might be known, the F word, not that one, but this one, funding. You know, people often ask me again, you know, so who's commissioned you? Who's, uh, how are you living? What's your normal job? But that's a, this, this is my normal job. This is my life. You know, you heard me say it right at the start there. I've thrown 
everything into this. So I have to be imaginative about how I work and how and how I um, fund it and earn a living from it. And right at the start, I did a typically purist thing, I guess, whatever purist means. But I thought I was going to make beautiful images and sell prints from them. Um, and that's exactly what I did. And, and I still do. You know, print sales are a bedrock of the project's funding. And when, when I get back from a mission, people often say, oh, enjoy the break. It's like, no, now I've got to scan those plates and make all the print orders so I can actually fund the thing. So I'm proud still to this day, you know, after seven years that the print sales uh, look after the costs of the project. And then I re realized that, you know, maybe people didn't want to buy photographs. I shouldn't be so proud to think that everybody would want to buy a photograph. So I started to think about other ways that I could um, make the project accessible, whether it's through postcard packs or things like this. A beautiful key ring with those words on that inspired me and thousands of lifeboat crews over, you know, over those nearly 200 years since 1824 with courage, nothing is impossible. And I released these for the first time in December 2016. And then um, one of the uh, lifeboat volunteers who I'd photographed at Cardigan Lifeboat Station, a chap called Simon, um, sent me this picture. He said, hey, Jack, I thought you might like to see this. And I said, Simon, that's just a beautiful. You've attached it to your pager. And he said, yeah, I know. I just thought it'd be a nice thing to have on my pager. And I asked him if he'd mind if I posted it online to show people. So I did. But then, of course, what happened? I started receiving more photographs and more photographs. And this is about where I'm at now. Here are 100 photographs of emergency pages with that key ring um, that helps to fund the project. And I just think that's a beautiful thing that the lifeboat volunteers themselves feel so engaged with the project that they want this item on there to remind them not only of the project, but those inspirational words that have inspired the, and motivated lifeboat crews for all that time and inspired me when I first started the project. And I mentioned the posters as well. And this is um, one of seven posters I installed in uh, North Wales last month, just exactly one month ago. This is the biggest one I've made so far, eight meters by four meters. But again, when it comes to funding, you know, how do I fund that? Well, it's, this poster is made up of 27 sheets, three rows of nine sheets. So all the images that I was posting and uh, that I was pasting onto the walls of Colwyn Bay in North Wales, I split them up into their sheets and put them on the website and said, sponsor the sheets for, you know, ask people to sponsor the sheets for £10. Um, and by the time I'd uh, come back from Colwyn Bay, all 71 sheets that I pasted on those walls were sponsored. Um, and that covered the, again, covered the costs of printing those, you know, huge artworks. But it's not always straightforward, you know, um, we're talking about the costs so far, not necessarily the living side. And sometimes I can end up feeling a bit like giant despair. And in 2017, I really started to hit rock bottom a bit. Um, and I got to my 100th lifeboat station in Valencia on the west coast of uh, on the west coast of Ireland in County Kerry. And the RNLI asked me to do a piece to camera um, to say what a wonderful occasion it was that I had reached my 100th station. But back then the stresses were really starting to come to the fore. You know, I, even though I was doing so well selling prints and whatnot and selling my um, other bits and pieces, like with the postcard packs, and I just sometimes couldn't join the dots. And it was all combined with the tiring nature of the project in itself. You know, it's very, very demanding, very, very physical. Um, I tried to do this piece to camera and this is about the 12th take. And I'm going to play you this 20 second clip now. And as you can see, it was all getting a bit too much. This is Valencia, my 100th. This is Valencia, my 100th station on this epic journey. As many of you all know, it's been a labor of love, but I couldn't have done it without you. And I couldn't have done it without the lifeboat volunteers themselves. I met so many of them, photographed so many of them, and interviewed so many of them. There's so many of them. So that was the beginning of the some kind of downfall there um, and my friend who was filming it said right we've got to stop this um, let's just get this video sent off and you know, we managed to do a good one in the end and I said pack everything away we're going to forget about it and we're going to um, 
forget about the project and we're just going to go up the uh, west coast of Ireland on our way home, take our time, go to some pubs, see some nice scenery and just relax a bit. And so my friend Duncan really helped me out in those moments and saved me from myself and the rigours of the project. But it's in those moments that I knew I had to come up with something else. Um, and I started to use Patreon. Um, and again, ignore this at the moment because I've gone through a whole process over the last year and a half through the pandemic of really looking deeply at these large platforms like Facebook and Instagram and Patreon, and I've stepped away from them. I no longer use Facebook-owned platforms to share the project or to, well, to do anything. I don't do anything on Facebook-owned platforms, and, and I was wary of Patreon going down a similar route, and so I've actually stepped away from Patreon as well. If you don't know what Patreon is, it's... Um, it's a membership platform that allows your supporters, people who enjoy your work and want to support you, they can do so on a monthly basis by paying you, you know, a monthly amount of money. And um, so I use Patreon intensively for um, a good three, three and a half years, but realized I had to take control of the situation really and be as independent as possible from all these big platforms that seem to be dominating the world. That's a whole other topic. We can discuss it later if you like. Um, so what did I do? To cut a long story short, I worked out how to build my own and I called it the LSP Society. And it's a membership platform that exists within the website. Um, so basically I've built my own form of Patreon now. Um, and there's a mem so there's this members area with all those extra audio clips and films and blog posts. So lots of the information is public, but a vast swathe of it's public, but there are these special treats, I mean, where the, the, you know, the extra supportive are extra rewarded and they have this area within the website now um, in return for their support. Um, and once I built the membership platform in, in lockdown too last November, so very nearly a year ago, um, I, when I'd left Facebook and Instagram, people were saying to me, oh, you should build your own platform, your own social platform. And I laughed it off at the time. But once I built my confidence building my membership platform, I thought, you know, maybe I could build an app. And that's exactly what I did. I built the LSP Society app. Um, so now, for the first time um, during the whole project, all of my supporters are not only connected to me, but they're connected to each other. And this now is the best way um, for them to follow what I'm up to in this independent app, the app that Jack built. And was it exciting to see my first notification come up in the app? Yes, it was. There you can see the, the icon there with the with the um, notification on it. That was a, an amazing moment and I just had to just had to photograph. And it's in that app that I can, you know, in that using that platform, that mechanism that I can share some more intimate stories with my um, with my patrons and my dedicated followers, uh, like this journey that I did just towards the end of September. So about four or five weeks ago, I lived uh, off grid in Scotland with a retired lifeboat couple who I'd met three years before and photographed at Loch Ness Lifeboat Station. They welcomed me into their home to take the lifeboat station project even deeper into lifeboat life. And I made some more glass plates, my first glass plates since the pandemic started. And what a wonderful thing to get back into the swing of that and share, um, share that work with the people who are supporting my journey and have done and have been rooting for me from day one. Um, and I'd like to make that all as accessible as possible. So full membership, um, to the LSB Society is available from just one pound a month. You know, again, going back to that notion of inclusive, inclusivity, um, I really want people to feel that no matter what they, their means, they can be involved. Um, and it's this kind of funding that means that um, pro it provides the living side. You know, if the print sales and the merchandise and all that kind of thing provides the, um, provides the uh, sorry, covers the costs, then now I'm really, again, doubly proud to, to know and think that the LSP Society now provides the living side of things and enables me to still be here in some of the most challenging times this generation's ever known and be giving talks like this. Um, and that, as they say, is about that. Uh, there's the web address, lifeboatstationproject.com. And if you do want to follow me in the, in the big bad world, I'm also on Project Lifeboat, but you'll find on the website um that there's a newsletter to sign up to um and lots of blog posts to read 
be prepared to lose a few hours basically <laughs> and uh, as you go down the huge rabbit hole that is now the lifeboat station project website but there you go that is that Hello, Jack. Yes, that was absolutely great. I'm sure everybody really enjoyed that. There were so many aspects for everybody to sort of something for everybody to take home with them, really. And um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions and answers. So if you want to put questions and answers in the question answer box, as I said before, um, there's a couple I thought of, which was uh, some people who weren't photographers may have questions about the um, when you touched on the inversion of the image. Do you want to say a bit more about that, perhaps, to explain that a bit more? Uh, yes. So when you, well, I'll put it this way, when I'm composing an image in a, in a camera, here's the, here's the camera I use, um, my, my 12 by 10 inch um, plate camera. Um, when I'm looking in, in the back at the focusing screen, the image is upside down and back to front, and the photographic film goes towards the lens when I load it up. So that means that when the images the when the image is projected onto that photographic film, if you then look at the photographic film, the image is upside down and back to front, and you can you can sort out the vertical inversion by turning the plate the right way up. But say if you're shooting on an opaque medium like metal, uh, like tin types, for example, you're always going to be stuck with the lateral inversion. The image will always be back to front. But the beauty of glass is that you can then turn it around we'll all have maybe well I say all uh, and it depends on how old we how old we are but I feel lucky enough to remember the days of loading up carousels and a slide projector and you get a slide the wrong way around sometimes you know it's exactly that same phenomenon we you know we could hold a little slide and look at it the right way around but when it was photographed it would have been upside down and back to front so it's it's physics basically of how light passes through a lens um and then just being conscious that you can depending on what medium you're using, that's you know, a great bonus of using glass that I can then just turn it around and look at the image correctly. Right, okay. And the other thing I thought perhaps was about the um, lenses, if you could say a bit more about the lenses, because I think that affects how you take the photograph, some of the qualities of the lenses. Yes, um, there, um, there are, there's a huge amount of stuff going through my mind at any one time when I'm working on the coast, you know, I shoot, I shoot everything with what you see here, one camera, one lens, that's, that is the camera and lens that I've used for every single plate on the lifeboat station project. It, from my point of view, it just removes a de decision, you know, I have to make everything work with what I've got. And I love that, you know, I love that kind of sense of jeopardy, I guess, um, whether it's a landscape or a portrait, all the pictures you've seen have been made with what you see here. But that lens, it doesn't perform like a, a modern lens with a with a, a flat focal plane. It's actually quite barreled. Um, and one of the reasons I used that um, Bucky crew portrait as an example is because if you think back to it, did you notice that the crew were all placed in a curve? Um, that isn't just to make a nice composition. It's also to make sure they're all going to be sharp. <laughs> um, and sometimes there's no way around it, you know, sometimes there's that there's no way around that situation. Um, but generally speaking, I, I feel, again feel quite chuffed to have, in all those different scenarios, at 150 lifeboat stations, I've made it work somehow, yeah. you know? So yes, working with an old lens isn't quite as straightforward, perhaps, as working with a modern multi-coated flat focal plane thing. But it's those lenses that give it the character as well, you know, it's, it's, it's those lenses that make it feel so soulful, if you like, or help to contribute to it feeling, you know, giving it that, that certain extra, extra something. Okay. Um, well, we've got a question here. What about the exposure time for the plates? <laughs> How many elephants? <laughs> um, well, yes. Um, in the early days of the project and in my early days of wet collodion, you know, because I come from a digital background of um, retouching and printmaking, gone down that route, um, even though I'd had an analogue start in life. You know, I converted my bedroom into a dark room when I was 12 and taught myself to, to um, process film and print from the negatives and that kind of thing. I'd end up going down this route of computers and measuring things. And we've all kind of got used to measuring things and light meters and all that kind of thing. And um, I don't know if he's here this evening, actually, a chap called Tony, um, who helped me in my early days of wet collodion. Um, and has been on the road with me a, a couple of times as well. He said to me, why are you using, I was using an app. Um, I can't remember what it's called now, Pinhole Assist. 
is called Pinhole Assist, an app to use your phone as a light meter for processes a bit like this, you know, longer exposures like this. And I said, well, you know, just to be sure, just to be sure of the, of the exposure. He said, you know what the exposure is. He said, put it away. You know what it's going to be. He said, tell me now what the exposure will be. So I said, oh, I don't know, like six elephants, at F22. He said, there you go, do it. And of course I did it and the plate was perfect without measuring it. So ever since that moment back in, I guess it was 2016, I haven't used any light measuring device. I just release myself to my intuition and looking around me and nearly every single time now I'll get the plate right first time, but the exposure times to, you know, this is the long answer to the question as always, the exposure times are always around about seven elephants, something like that under good conditions. I never like to go less than five because, you know, if you picture that the lens cap is my shutter, you know, there's no shutter involved here other than the lens cap. If I take the lens cap off and put it back on and there's a bit of an error, an error on a shorter exposure and how I've done that, that error becomes a large proportion of the exposure. So I never like to take the exposures much less or less at all than five seconds, five elephants, I try and keep them at that or more so that any errors from on my part um, aren't such a huge proportion of the exposure. So they, but then they can vary between anything from six, seven elephants up to two to four minutes sometimes, just depends on the scene and the lighting conditions. Um, but the, I can't really with, a crew, you know, where people are involved, go for anything more than about 20 seconds, something like that, 20 elephants, um, because it, because people just can't stand still that long, quite frankly, you know, um, so many people can't stand still that long. Um, so there you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did the crew ever get called out on a shout while you were setting up? <laughs> yes, yes, it's happened. The first time it happened was in Yarmouth on the Isle of Wight um, in January 2016. Um, the crew all lined up on the on the quayside with the seven class lifeboat behind. You know, a really fantastic scene. Um, and just as I was focusing the image through the back of the camera, I hadn't yet made the glass plate. I was just composing the image. The pages sounded in their pocket, um, and they looked at each other and they looked at me and they said, "Jack, we've got to go." I said, "Yeah, I know. You you go." And they saved seven minutes on their normal launch time because they were already there, kitted up. Um, so they just uh, went onto the lifeboat, fired her up. Um, as an amusing detail, it's amusing to me, the coxswain stayed there standing by himself in his position. And when they got the lifeboat fired up and they're ready to throw the ropes off. I said, uh, Howard, are you coming? And he just looked at me and said, see you later, Jack. And he walked off and drove the life lifeboat out into the howling gale um, and saved the lives of two teenage world-class sailors dinghy sailors whose boat had capsized and the master got trapped in a lobster pot. Um, they transferred him via helicopter, um, transferred the boys by helicopter. They went off to Southampton General Hospital. An hour later, the lifeboat pulled back into the um, harbour and they got off the lifeboat and said, where would you like us? Same place. And that crew photograph of the Yarmouth crew is of them having just saved the lives of two teenage boys. It went down as two lives saved. Um, and if you search for Yarmouth drama on the website in the search box, you'll find the blog post and the little film that describes all that. <laughs> okay, great. Um, somebody asking about uh, the prints and the scanning. Um, could you say a bit about the scanning of the glass plates and they presume the prints are inkjet? Yes, that's right. Um, my inkjet printer, is under this huge RNLI flag here. This, um, this is the uh, people who might like to know. This is a wonderful gift from Dover Lifeboat Station. This flag, by the way, um, before they've they've just swapped it for a new one, and they thought we know who'd like the old one. So this is the old Dover Lifeboat Station flag that's now a, a cover over my printer. So yes, the prints are are inkjet prints, um, but the very hot. Uh, finest quality on Hanamula papers using HP Vivera inks. So the quality is extraordinary. Um, and I've used those, you know, that paper and ink combination for, well, since about 2004, 2005 now. Um, and scanning the glass plates, um, I have a, a large A3 scanner um, that I can put the, so I put the glass plates onto the platen. And again, Mark Vos, the chap who's made these boxes for me and mixes my chemicals and is a general uh, 
behind the scenes stoic chap um he's made me a, a hood um which is velvet lined that when i put the glass plate on the platen because obviously it's like a very thin negative i need to give it the um give it the shadows back without having a kind of surface that the scanner tries to focus on so this this velvet lined hood sits off the plate and gives me the blacks i need so i'll put the glass plate onto the platen the this lovely velvet lined hood over the top of the glass plate and then i can essentially scan it like like a print and it makes this beautiful high resolution um digital archive of the glass plate um, and as you've just seen the kind of quality there, you know, with the Bucky plate, when I went in and looked at those a few faces on that one glass plate, and then st step back out. That's the kind of quality that I can get um, from working in that way. So yes, then once I have the digital file, that enables me to put the work online, of course, um, and show the world the work and to make other things like leaflets and um, all these things that help to promote the project. Um, and then also to make the prints, the very prints that fund the project. So yes, all these skills that I've learned over the um, last 20, 25 years, you know, sometimes you wonder why you're doing something at a certain stage in your life, but with the Lifeboat Station project, it's all become clear because all of these skills have just come into the Lifeboat Station project. I'm using every single one of them. <laughs> yeah, and I have to say your prints are beautiful. I can, I've seen them. So, I mean, they are, they are lovely. Thank you very um, much. There's some questions about the varnish that you use. Um, mm. Somebody asked if they were varnished in the 19th century. Well, I can say that they were because I can answer that one. Um, but uh, what do you what do you use for varnishing the plates? Um, again, Mark makes my varnish for me. It's a shellac varnish um, right. um, that just gives. I mean, again, you know, every single process you go, go through this roller coaster of emotions and heartache when you're learning. Um, but every single motion and every single, like, you know, I, I order the varnish ahead of time from Mark and sometimes I store it for up to six months to a year before I even use it to, I don't know if it's right or not, I'm not a chemist, you know, I just know what to do with things in the right order and how to troubleshoot and make things work when they break. Um, but um, I found that when I, when I've received the varnish and try and use it straight away, it's kind of too um, active, if you like, and a bit too hot. Uh, for want of a better word and if i let it settle down for a few months it becomes nice and gentle and gives me a beautiful finish um i'm sure that there be people who say no just use fresh varnish and do it straight away but you find what works for you and so that's that's what i do but every so yes i use this beautiful varnish that he makes for me meticulously um i tend to order it in batches a few months ahead of when i use it and then i have these huge huge varnishing sessions doing sometimes you know hundreds of plates over weeks um and storing them it's one of the most most unseen sides of the project one of the you know it, the conservation and archiving side is huge and extraordinarily expensive as well you know it's another really expensive side of the project that people often don't think about um about the you know once you've made a glass plate how are you going to store it safely and what are you going to store it in i've just been speaking to conservation by design today um as it happens one, one of my suppliers of those things and with my heart in my mouth at how some of the costs of archive conservation materials have gone through the roof. I've got one particular shop with the four leaf enclosures. Um, and I've just through gritted teeth placed an order for another batch of just the four leaf enclosures, but it costs basically about three, well, about four pounds per plate to store it. Mm. Four to five pounds, per, just in material costs alone, like the paper and card, that that side of it before we even think about the varnish and all of that and i've told you how many plates i've made <laughs> so you do the maths <laughs> you <know? laughs> um yeah so there is it it's an operation in every way which every which way you look it's a serious operation for an individual to undertake mm -hmm. yeah well speaking of that somebody's asked here from paul lifeboat crew and uh, asked uh, when you're going to be back on the road again. Uh, fingers severely crossed for March. You know, I, 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 I work on the coast between March and September um, during British summertime hours because I need the ultraviolet content and the light to be decent to guarantee a, a full day's 
work um, with the light. So I, my usual pattern is um, photographing about 30 lifeboat stations a year between March and September. And then the, the, the winter time is the archiving of the work and um, lots of talks and the other promotional sides of the, of the project um, and making the prints of course and all that kind of thing. Um, and then it takes me a good, so it takes, like when I've returned from the road, it takes a good four to six weeks to scan all the plates and get them online. Um, and then further weeks to make all the prints. And then the same when I'm building up to go on the coast again, you know, I need to start planning that um, late January, early February to make sure that I can hit the road in March. So there's not actually much of a window of any kind of respite, if you like, even in the winter months. Um, again, long answer to the question, March, I hope. And it, um, if anybody can put a kind word in for me, if you're from Paul Lifeboat Station and uh, therefore perhaps very close to the headquarters or even in the headquarters, please March, March would be great. Well, I think we've got, we'll go on for another five minutes or so with questions. We've got quite a lot of questions if you're okay with that. So um, can you manipulate the development to suit the exposure? Yes, yeah, there, there are various things again that I have in my head, um, depending on the conditions and, and what's actually happened. So if there's been a mistake with the exposure or I'm watching the plate and it's not developing quite as quickly as I'd like it to. Yes, you can you can um you, you can lengthen the development, not by too much, because then you get um um a, a veiling over the over the plate, which can be problematic in itself, you know, um through you know, you can, various other problems come into play when you take things out of the normal bounds of the process. Um, so yes, you can manipulate it to a degree, but the the windows within which to do that are always quite narrow. But you know, when I'm developing a plate, for example, I, I'm looking and listening to three different things. I'm listening to the clock that's right by my head here. So I'm counting the seconds so I don't lose track of how much time has elapsed. So I just have an idea of how much time has elapsed. Um, and I'm observing the plate, of course, to see what's happening. Um, and then I'm smelling the plate too, because the smell changes when they're, I don't, I haven't seen this written anywhere. Somebody might correct me and say it is written somewhere, but the smell suddenly changes when the plate's correctly developed. And I have the, the stop ready to pour over it and develop it um, and stop it at just the right moment. So those three things, um, when they all combine, uh, you know, when they all synchronize, that's when the plates perfectly develop for me. And um, and the key really, though, is to make sure the exposure is right. Make sure the exposure is right and everything else falls into place. OK, because somebody's asked about what you think makes a beautiful and compelling image. And can you pick a favorite? <gasps> No. I know that's probably an awful question. No, it's, it's a great question, but it's maybe not <laughs> one I can answer. <laughs> um, you know, it's back to that sentiment of them all being like children, you know, you love them all the same, just differently. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, but of course there are plates that um, really are compelling in different reasons, you know, for different reasons. It could be a boathouse view that's compelling for a, a particular reason. For example, um, a large slipway take the lizard you know the one that um, i showed you with the funicular lift that takes you 140 feet down the cliff face that slipway is vast you know the 32 ton tamar class lifeboat goes careering down when it launches on service so that can be a very compelling plate if you get the exposure right there um, and all that detail in the grid of the slipway and the handrails and the sea um go and find it on the on the website um and that's a very compelling image. Likewise, a state-of-the-art Shannon-class lifeboat photograph with an 1851 process with 27 volunteers on it. You can maybe see a print of it just um, above my shoulder here, the Ilfra Coombe lifeboat crew. Um, within the community, you know, a real moment of, in time in the RNLI, a mixture of men and women on a state-of-the-art vessel in an old seaside town on this beautiful process, only made in a beautiful way that joins the dots with the old and the new when something comes together like that that too is a um a glorious thing but could i ever say i have a favorite no <laughs> <laughs> well a couple of questions perhaps to um end someone wants to know if you take on apprentices and if yes are you accepting applications <laughs> 
Um, I'm always happy to be in touch with people. I have a lovely, I, I must confess, I do have a lovely... You've got to be quiet there. Oh, can you hear me now? It sort of came and went a bit. It might be me, but... Uh... Okay. Um, I... Over the years, I, I have a lovely pool of friends um, who tend to help me out. You know, one of my friends, um, Hen, he's been on, he's been to over 30 lifeboat stations with me. Um, and what tends to happen, to be honest, is that people drop me a line. Um, and the best I can say, really, is that sometimes people just turn up and they end up, and I end up um, mucking, you know, getting people to muck in because there are so many things that people can help with. So basically, if you happen to be around, um, you know, if I'm in your area and you want to come along, drop me a line if you want to beforehand. We'll come along on the day, and fear not, I will find a job for you, and you will get to, <laughs> and you'll get to see wet collodion in full flow. Well, you'll be pleased to know that quite a few people have made comments from lifeboat crews, and they're all very complimentary. Oh, so they've good. obviously survived <laughs> the experience. Yeah, they. So. Yeah, sometimes there, there have been um, some moments. I think particularly in the early days when I was. Uh, shall we say, getting my routine sorted um, when, when, I, when I took a bit longer than I would have liked. But I think as, as the years have gone on, I've got a bit slicker at it. But yeah. oh, it's, I can't see you all. But hello, everyone. It's, it's great to know that you're all here. <laughs> uh, the last one is, uh, well, a bit of an open ended question. But have you thought what you might do when the project's finished? I'm always thinking, Susie, always <laughs> thinking. Um, There's no conclusions. <laughs> yeah, the, the I I tell you one thing about the lifeboat station project because it has become so vast now, much bigger than I ever dreamed. Not just within um, the simple idea of going to every single lifeboat station and being the first person to make a unified body of work of every lifeboat station. You know, and as you know, we've been to 150 of those 238 now. Um, but the layers and layers of life, it kind of, you know, the, the, the thing I alluded to just towards the end there of living with a retired lifeboat couple for 10 days, going even deeper into lifeboat life and being welcomed into their home as if it's my own. Um, I, I, I sometimes wonder when the lifeboat station project will end um, and, if it, and if it ever will. Um, and that won't be a bad thing because it really clearly bring something to the party not only for me but for everyone involved and, and you know it, it hopefully enriches the world in some way but I do have other ideas um, <laughs> and I do have other things that the that I'll be thinking about when the when the project starts to come to a close but for now you know I just feel quite relaxed that I don't actually need to put a any kind of barriers on the lifeboat station project I, I imagine that the stations will be finished in about three years time but who knows which direction you then then there'll be the exhibition to make after that that will take time to put that all together and the book and whatnot who knows what to watch this space as ever but I'll tell you one thing I was 39 when I started it when I got first hit the coast I didn't think that I'd be nearly 50 when I finished it <laughs> if if I'd known that at the time and if anybody else had known that at the time they may not have got behind me because they said 10 years but uh here we all are and isn't it excellent yeah well, thank you. I think everybody will agree that was an absolutely wonderful talk. And thank you for being so generous with your expertise and letting us share it all. It was really, really interesting. Oh, so, my pleasure. Um, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting yeah, great. me. <laughs> so thank you all, everybody who watched it and participated tonight. And as I say, I hope you've all enjoyed it. So um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to invite NAN members to join as members. We welcome supporters as well as practitioner members. And you can sign up via our website where you will also find more details about the benefits of men uh, membership. We hope that you can join us for our next talk. They're nothing if not varied. And the next talk will be the conservation and installation of two locomotives to Dana Museum during the pandemic. Another good news story. So which will be on Tuesday, the 14th of December. So do check our website for details and a link will, I think it has appeared in the chat. So thanks again to all our panelists and thank you all for watching and have a very good night. <laughs>